All right, we're back here on the Chase Must Podcast, taping this late on a Wednesday with John Taylor of Fangraphs.com. John, good evening, sir. How are you? I am doing well. How about yourself? Not too bad. Not too bad. I am uh, a little shaken by not having the New York skyline behind you this evening. I don't know how the podcast will go. Yeah, I mean, of it. viewers will just have to adjust to the fact that they won't be just sudden. They won't just suddenly see a city come like slightly into view as the sun goes down. Right. But instead, they'll just get the relatively static backdrop of where I am now. I like it though, because when I go on the, my YouTube, like when I, you can check this out on YouTube.com and type in the Chase Homes podcast, you'll find it there. But on the John episodes, when you watch the full episode, you can just quickly skim and you can <laughs> skim the skyline. So yeah. that's a cool thing where you just like. You can see the sun fall. It's really great. Yeah. That, that's what you can do. Um, but, John, I have a fan. I am glad that we're taping this on a Wednesday this week and not a Tuesday because I have a national pastime for you, sir. Okay. I uh, You're going to love this one. So, okay. today, in 1920, after a lengthy argument about a questionable call of a ground ball double over third base with home plate umpire Barry McCormick, Reds manager Pat Morin and uh, several players returned to their positions to resume the contest. Cincinnati center fielder Ed Roosh. Is it Roosh? Roush? Do we know? Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Okay, well, he also spells his name Ed with two Ds, which is unbelievable, and I've never seen that before in my life. Were you you not a fan of Ed, Ed, and Eddie? (laughs) My brother was more of a Cartoon Network guy. I was never a big cartoon guy. That was never... I was Power Rangers. I was like uh, Big Bad Beetleborgs. I was... I don't you're know. Just, of, you're more of the live action genre. Yes, I was more of the live action kind of kid. Okay. Um, but yeah, so Ed Roush, well, apologies to the Roush family if that is not how you pronounce that last name, uh, growing bored after a few minutes of the prolonged debate, decides to nap on the outfield grass and gets ejected for delay of game when he doesn't wake up promptly. Simpler times, was, John. Yeah. That's just, I mean, you've never heard of that, of a guy just deciding to take an... I mean, there was a time in that Red Sox game, Manny Ramirez went to use the bathroom, and he came back late from the field because he got stuck in it. Because there was a little, I think it was a little bathroom in the Green Monster. Yeah. Um, Is that still there? And they had to delay the game. I believe so. Hmm. Have you used have it? they have to have somewhere, I think, I've never used it. I have to, they have to have somewhere for the scoreboard operator to go, I think. Um, hmm. I think players in the outfield probably use it between innings, but... Interesting. Uh, I've, never, I've never been inside the Green Monster, though. I've only been on top of it. How is it on top of the Green Monster? It's very cool. The, so the one time I've been up there was not during a game, but as press during game one of the ALDS back in 2018 between the Yankees and the Red Sox. Mm-hmm. And so I went up there mostly just because, one, I'd never been up there, so I figured, well, why not? You know, with a press pass, I can go up there if I want. Mm-hmm. And two, to watch batting practice, because watching BP from there is very cool, because you get balls just coming directly at you on, like, s- like scalding line drives, but, mm. yeah, very, very cool vantage place to to watch a game, or at least to watch any baseball from. I, I don't think I was able to get up there during the game itself. Um, Do you feel super high, like you're in the clouds? That's my well, concern. Yeah, because it's, I mean, it's, it's, you're, like, 40-some feet in the air, 40, yeah. 45, whatever it happens to be, because the wall itself is 37 feet, plus the seats and the stands rise a little above that. Um, it's, I don't know if it's the tallest point in the park. I don't know if hmm. the area, like the press box area over home plate um, is taller, mm. but it's it's way up there in a way that you usually only get in stadiums that have like the big outer decks. Like, yeah. For can stadium, you get season that's... tickets for those or no? Um, I believe you can. It used to be a lot. There used to be a lottery system for it hmm. back when they originally announced it but yeah or when they originally created those seats i don't i don't know what the what the ticketing uh, system there is is there for mm. now though Interesting. Or there's what ticketing system there is now though yeah um but there you go uh back in the day can you imagine that happening today like you're just ejected because you didn't wake up promptly i love the oh, idea yeah, if, of not waking if... up promptly like does that just mean he was groggy and it was just going to take him too long to get reacclimated yeah, that... to the real world like what does that mean how that's do you a, expect someone to question. get up that like yeah, did they did they figure like he was just gonna immediately pop like does it was just one jostle and they turned the ump and he's like no he's dead asleep and the ump's like all right kick him out then right like or was he just slowly getting like once once they woke him up to get mm-hmm. him off the field theoretically like shouldn't they have just been able to like, okay you're awake now play ball exactly this is very silly this this feels this feels like there was something bigger at work here I love that the idea that like he's just tossed like what happened oh, bad day at the office Ed Roosh yeah Roush. like you go home. 
and your wife's like, how was the game? And you're like, ah, it was one oh. to forget. I, I got caught sleeping and they're like, oh, were you in a rut? Were you in a rundown? No, 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 no. no. I was no, literally, I caught, literally caught sleeping caught in the sleeping. outfield and they, that's frowned upon. Like I, I, got, I got sent home from work because they caught me taking a nap. Like, mm. <laughs> True story, John. My first job ever when I was 16 years old, uh, back in Stone Mountain, Georgia, I, uh, I got fired uh, two months in, it was at a movie theater. I may or may not have hopped from theater to theater to take naps. And Good idea. Uh, smart. that's, I finally got caught, but it was one of those where I was like, you got me. I was like the Walter White situation of like, you got me. And yeah, or, or even just the, the, I wish you'd pull the George Costanza and been like, is that wrong? <laughs> was I not allowed to do that? <laughs> no, trust me. I've done that at other jobs where it's like, oh, well, is that silverware? Is that something that bartenders and servers have to take care of silverware that doesn't yeah. sound right Amen. boss makes a dollar you make a dime that's why you nap on company time i like it i like it uh john taylor uh things that i don't really like because this means that we might get another postseason without shohei otani and mike trout the vibes were too good for too long in los angeles and joe madden has been fired levin is now in for him uh two firings in the last seven or so days um, both with red team. So if you're uh, <laughs> a fan of a team with, if you're uh, if you're David Bell, um, I was gonna say you're in. Pack you're, lightly, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're renting. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like this is this is kind of wild. Like the Angels, once they lost that series, I think they got swept by the Blue Jays. Is when the free fall started, and then they just never recovered. It just never got better. And man, are they just? Like I think the Red Sox now have a better record than the yes. Angels. The what Red y'all Sox are like two games over five hundred? By, they're they're up on the Angels by two and a half games in the wild card standings going into today's games. Okay, that's um, just what happened, John. Why are the Angels just? Was it just injuries? Is it just bad luck? I, like what I, happened? I mean, it, it's it's all of the above. I mean, obviously there are injuries involved. Uh, the big ones: Anthony Rendon, who has been out uh, for. Sorry, who has been out since May 26 because of right wrist inflammation? Uh, Taylor Ward, who has been out since has been on the injured list since Saturday, but reality, you know, hurt his shoulder, hit it running into a wall back on the 20th, and missed half the games from that point forward. Didn't hit well when he was in the game, so clearly been dealing with it for a bit there. You know, those were two of their three best position players by war, with the other being uh, obviously Trout. Most teams can't survive that, and as we've said with the Angels, ad nauseum for what feels like forever, they especially can't survive that. They are not a team built to to, 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 uh, to win without their stars. Because, I mean, this this is already a team where even when you already had Rendon and Trout and Otani and, and whatever else, you also still had a middle infield of Andrew Velasquez slash Tyler Wade and Luis Rengifo. Like, mm. you know, th- this is the perpetual problem with the Angels, is that there is just not enough depth ever for them to survive any bad stretch. Similarly, you see... You know, some of the some of the bad performance so far has come out of their bullpen. Their bullpen has an ERA over six during this uh, during this losing stretch. Granted, the you know the starters have been even worse, but that's kind of thing. The pitching has not been there either. And I know that you know you and I when they signed Syndergaard, we're like, okay, fine, great. Like you know, if he's healthy, there's some real value there, and you know, this is probably more upside than an Angels free agent addition have had in quite some time. And he's been okay. Rotation. He's been okay. But they didn't really do anything else. They added right. Michael Lorenzen, who has also been pretty much okay. Um, but you could we could even tell in that rotation before the season started, you still felt like this is still a guy short, you know. Mm. Even with Otani, even with Syndergaard, even with um, actually that's about it. That's about where my <laughs> mind cuts off. I mean, I know they had Reed Detmers, uh, someone they were really excited about, but that has not particularly worked out. Um, aside, his no hitter aside, but that didn't that did not really feel like a no hitter. That was like, ooh, there's something new here. That felt more like a no hitter. Was like, okay, cool. That's just one of those no hitters that happens. You know, mm. um, nothing is working on this team. Um, the injuries to the lineup are really obviously very very difficult. Um, you know, and then like you said, like the you're right. They they lost four to the Blue Jays. They got swept. Um, they got swept in that series. They lost three of, in a row by one single run. Mm-hmm. And then they got demolished by the Yankees. And like. Some of this is just, you know, that's a t- they've had a tough run of the last few teams. Blue Jays, Yankees, Phillies, who even with their, you know, with their mess that we're, I imagine, that we got. No, the Phillies are back, John. Phillies As back, you tweeted though. out, the Phillies are back. Phillies are back. 
and then they get a Red Sox team that's on the up and up. But at the same time, this is again, this is this is what we have come to expect from the Angels in years previous. That the at the first you know the first real st- set of injuries really exposes how little depth this team has and how how quickly things can snowball. And you saw that one with the fact that they've lost thirteen straight games, and two with the fact that this was all it took to cost Joe Madden his job. Which I think speaks to a bigger issue probably there that Madden was just not the right guy here anymore. I think kind of similar to with Joe Girardi in Philly, you can you can say, like, listen, it's not Joe Madden's fault that this team doesn't have a good rotation, that this team doesn't develop its players well, that this team, you know, that the, the guys in this lineup are injury prone, that Mike Trout is now on the on the back end of his career, that blah, blah, blah. You know, these are not exactly his problems. But as with Girardi, what you can offer is, well, what was he doing to make anything better? Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't really get the vibe that Joe Madden, especially coming out of Chicago the way he did, where it just seemed like he was completely not just burnt out, but also like everyone there had just stopped listening to him. Yeah. And everyone there had just tuned out his particular brand of bullshit. And I, I, I mean, I say I am not a Joe Madden fan. I never have been. I've always found him a deeply annoying manager who coasts on reputation more than anything else. So, you know, my but my bias noted and my bias aside, like. I, I I never particularly understood that signing as anything other than we got the biggest name we could. Yeah. You know, and that we were, you know, we, we're, we're going to make up for what we lack in, in, you know, ideas and innovations with star power and big personalities. And that's just not, you're not going to win that way. Like Joe yeah. Madden is not the difference for, was not going to be the difference for this Angels team because Joe Madden was not, a, Joe Madden, it's not Joe Madden's responsibility and certainly not something he can do to, to make the farm system better or to make their player development better or to make better free agent choices. But also, I, again, I don't really get what the Angels saw out of Joe Madden at the end in Chicago when it seemed like his entire team had tuned him out and thought to themselves, yeah, this is the guy we want to, to take this team forward, you know? Yeah. I never particularly understood that, and it definitely seemed by the end there, and I don't know if you saw the uh, transcript of the postgame game presser that Madden did where he started getting into a little bit with uh, oh, an angel beat writer Sam Bell where mm. they basically just started arguing about you know more or less about you know our, our guys still playing hard for you and Madden answered in the kind of defensive slippy like slip aside way that just really suggests not really no but I don't want to admit that so I'm going to start a fight well, it's like yeah what, what do you want Madden to say there yeah well, they no, have he's, to he's not gonna, actually he's not they're not playing as say, hard yeah, he's not going to come out and say that like Mike Trout is currently leading an insurrection against me. Mm-hmm. But the fact that he can't give a straight answer to that of just no, like the team is still playing hard, like more that, of a desktop. That, that suggests that there was more. There was probably some stuff going on behind the scenes, as of the fact that when Ro- that when um, Madden was interviewed about it, both by uh, Team Beats and Ken Rosenthal got an interview with him not long after he got let go. Um, Madden made it seem like he's not fully on board with the way the Angels do things with regards to data and analytics. Yeah. Which also is not surprising. He is a cranky old man and... Then why would you go from Socha to Madden? That's the other thing. That's, that, just... I don't, that, but I don't think the Angels really understood that. I think that they still saw the guy who was great in Tampa Bay and who mm-hmm. led the Cubs to a World Series and who had always had this reputation of being a, a maverick, of being a you know guy who zigs where everyone zags, of being an iconoclast, of being you know someone who is who is cool with analytics and who is very cutting edge, but that's just not Joe Madden, you know, yeah. that, that, especially not at this point in his career on his third different team, um, you know, after 20 some, nearly 20 some years of, of managing and even longer of being a coach and, you know, but just, if you're going to you know, be that, you got to be kind of like Snicker where you're just kind of laid back and the club yeah. likes you and you And are, that's the thing, Snicker, yeah. Snicker is a better vessel for that stuff, mm-hmm. I think, because of the because of the qualities you mentioned. He is an unassuming guy who's just kind of in the background. Yeah. You know? And I, Madden's I remember, just not like that. And Neither is Girardi. No, and, and those guys are forward-facing, old-school managers who are very much about, I want to run things my way. You know, I the, think... the reliever rule with Girardi is wild. I didn't even know about that with, uh, I saw that in Verducci's piece where I was yeah, like, Yeah, with about what? Not, wanting, not wanting to run a guy out a third day in a row, but then he Regardless does Regardless of pitch counter of yeah. circumstance, it's just the rule. It's so yeah, arbitrary. And, and, I mean, Why die on that hill? The, that goes back to all the binder stuff back in New York that Girardi had, all, had acquired yeah. this reputation as being a very inflexible guy when it came to his strategic and tactical decision making. Yeah. And I think you could see probably the same with Madden. It's just a guy who's not really all that... He doesn't, he doesn't really seem to have any fresh ideas. I know we've said this, too, about Tony La Russa, where it's just mm. like these guys are just from a straight-up different era of baseball. Um, in particular, again, Girardi, La Russa, Madden, they are Man, used we could to... see all three out, never manage again after this year. I would not be... I would... I would. I definitely doubt Girardi is going to manage again. I think he is probably yeah. through. I would guess that Madden will be 
I am going to guess that Madden will probably end up somewhere next season because someone's really? going to be able to. I, I, I don't know, but I, I can see him desperately wanting to stick it out. I think if, if Larusa goes, he's almost certainly that's it because yeah. he's only here because of Jerry Reinsdorf. I was going to say if they don't make the playoffs, he's out. I think yes, even I, if they I don't win if, a I playoff think the series, White, I mean, he's out. I think if the White Sox miss the playoffs, I think both Larusa and Han are out. I think mm. that has to be the end of that. Of yeah. Not only of Larusa, but the end of that particular brain trust because of just how little it has returned so far, but. With regards to Madden, again, one of those guys who isn't more old. I mean, again, he was part of that, you know, new school approach in Tampa and I, and to a certain degree in Chicago. But at the same time, like he he very clearly expects to be able to run a team the way he wants to run a team. And it doesn't really seem like there's agreement with that with the Angels. And I'm not surprised because ultimately Madden wasn't the choice of Perry Manassian. He is a holdover from the Billy Epler regime. Mm -hmm. You know, this was a guy that Manassian inherited. And I think especially coming from Atlanta and seeing the way things worked with Snitker and everything, I imagine that what Manassian wants is someone more along those lines, a Snitker or like a Charlie Ron Montoyo Washington or a Ron Washington, a longtime coach, maybe getting a first gig or someone coming from a more kind of low key background where he is not the manager is not the star, you know, and I think sounds like Walt Weiss if I ever heard it. Yeah. And I but I think we're in a point, too, where it's like the like how many like. I mean, I don't know. It seems like, you know, we, we've probably long ago left the days when the managers were the stars and like, you know, the days where baseball was, I think, closer to college basketball. And it's like the guy who made the decisions was the guy everybody knew. And mm -hmm. then there were just a handful of players under. I mean, I, that's maybe never exactly been the case, but I, I think that era, I, I mean, I think it's been over, but I think you're seeing with Madden and Girardi both going down. I think we're seeing a point where it's like baseball teams just don't really want these guys anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, they want guys who are just on 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 the same page with them from day one you know they, they don't want to have these discussions these hassles and to that effect like i said like i don't know that jo that joe madden made this angels team worse but i don't think he made them better and it really seemed clear that they were not in agreement on how things should go going forward so i'm not surprised he's gone but it does say a lot about the angels that their first really bad patch this season was enough to get rid of him you know that they that they had already it feels like they had already decided internally before the season even started anything goes wrong he's gone you know, yeah. I, I don't get the sense that the Angels really want. And, you know, the fact that Madden was also, you know, had one year left on his contract, but there had seemingly been no noise about any extension, about, you know, New Deal, very much seemed like the Angels were more than ready to move on from him. But, I mean, like you said, the disappointment just comes from the fact that this Angels team is bad again. And, you know, maybe they will bounce back once they get Rendon and Ward back and if they're able to add some pitching help. But they need to add a lot of pitching help. I don't know. I, I it just thinks it thinks we're we're probably gonna get another October without Mike Trout, without Shohei Otani, without you know. Um, well, Nevin might be better him. though. I mean, he's a obviously a long time veteran, somebody I assume they respect. He's a California dude. Maybe maybe that helps. I don't know. I mean, it can't it can't hurt necessarily to have a different voice. Um, yeah. Obviously, the question is how tactically ready is Phil Nevin to be a manager to deal with stuff like. He was in changes. New York first, right? Wasn't he? He was. In New York? He was uh, the third base coach for yeah. Aaron Boone the last few years before going out west. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of you know, especially because this is an Angels team that ta that does require you to be tactically adept and flexible because it is a pretty middling roster. Like mm. you don't have good relievers. You know, as uh, as our piece on the whole situation by Jay Jaffe noted, the the Angels bullpen has. Uh, the third lowest number of fastballs thrown 95 miles an hour or higher this season. You know, hmm. there are not hard throwers in that bullpen. There are not guys you can rely on to get outs um, on the regular with the exception of Rysel Iglesias, you know. Similar, hmm. like we said, the middle infield is a mess. Like, you know, they have injuries. They're, they do not have the prospect depth to, you know, to fill holes right now as, as need be. Like, I mean, that well, it's also probably part of Madden's failing here is that unlike Tampa and Chicago, which gave him good, young, flexible rosters with a big farm system that keep that kept, you know, pushing help up to the major league level when needed, that's just not the Angels. They don't have yeah. that flexibility. They don't have that farm system. And that's also probably part of it is that in so much as a, an MLB manager can have a system, you know, the Joe Madden system as it was, was presumably, okay, we'll just do what we did in Tampa and Chicago, but that requires a better franchise than the Angels. Um, I mean, ultimately, I guess that's the thing. This is just a, yet another reflection of just how poorly run this franchise is, you know, and that, as we've noted before, every time starts at the very top with Artie Moreno, who is very easily one of the worst one owners in the sport, just categorically bad at this job at, yeah. at simply running a baseball team. And I would not be surprised, too, if Madden was more than anything, you know, a Moreno hire, another mm. name that he could sell, because ultimately, I think 
I think a lot of what happens with the Angels, too, is they are in competition locally in terms of eyeballs, in terms of attention, in terms of money with the Dodgers. And the Dodgers have been stomping them their ass up and down the street for the last decade in terms of on-field success, you know, including mm-hmm. World Series, obviously. The Angels, besides Trout and Otani, don't really, besides Trout and Otani, they don't have anything to offer in that category. You know, they're a yeah. bad team that has not made the playoffs in eight years now, or seven seasons, and this will probably be the eighth. You know, there's not a whole lot to sell them. So I can still, I can see Moreno being that guy. It's like, get me the big manager, you know, get me mm-hmm. the guy who's won a World Series. Get me the guy who's, you know, who, who the reporters love and who the, you know, who has a good, you know, who's a, who's a positive, like whatever. It's like, again, I, I, you just don't see the level of thinking or of kind of foresight necessary to run a good team uh, coming from the Angels, you know? And, and that's not to say that Manassian and company can't do it, but mm. I think at the very least with Artie Moreno in charge, it's really hard to see how that happens because this is the inevitable end result of all his meddling and all his dumb decisions. Go Angels. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's team- like if you're an Angels fan, like what... How can, what do you feel at this point other than just the same creeping sense of dread of just this has all been a waste, you know? Uh, John, trivia. How many yes. teams did Phil Nevin play for in his career? Okay. I'm going to guess five. Very good guess. Can you name the five? No. I, I know the Padres are one of them. Padres are one. He was on the Angels at one point. That I is think. true. That it's two. This just got really hard. Um, Milwaukee? I don't know where that came from. No, but close. Minnesota is where Minnesota. he retired. Okay. And then I'm, I'm at total zero on what's left. So he started with the Astros. Okay. Then went to the Tigers for a couple of years. Okay. Then to the Angels. Yep. Then to the Padres for a long time. I remember I remember Phil Nevin as a Padre first. Yes. Almost. Um, and then he went to the Cubs. Or the Rangers, excuse me. Okay. Then the Cubs. Okay. Then the Twins. I have no recollection total. of his post Padres playing career. Like this man almost played for a third of the league. Shout out to him. Yeah. Shout out to Phil, Nevin, Phil Nevin, former number two pick the year he was drafted, I believe, he in nineteen ninety nineteen eighty nine or sorry, yeah, nineteen ninety two. He was the yeah, that's right. Phil Nevin is a one one. He was the first pick of the ninety two draft. There you go. By the Houston Astros his... out of Cal State Fullerton. Yeah, because he got a he was drafted in the third round by the Dodgers originally out of high school the and ni- then chose the ninety two to... draft, aka the Derek Jeter draft. The Derek Jeter draft, who's also very good on Twitter. I don't know if it's actually Derek Jeter. It's not. It can't but... be. It, it like... can't be. The the Derek Jeter that I have heard talked about. In That's what I'm these, saying. It's just like it where has this be guy been forever? It's it's the same. I assume it's the same. It's the same thing as Tom Brady. Tom Brady has no visible, discernible personality beyond like mm. kind of like overactive golden retriever no that's more like a that's more a gronk brady's like a fancy dog i was but gonna say he there, golden retrievers are in there he's brady is definitely has someone running his his twitter account and his social media 100 percent. i could see that man this the 92 draft is a collection of real guys who's uh, in that draft Paul Shuey, michael tucker Ooh. ron valone all-time guy uh rick helling chojo charles johnson loved him uh, bj wallace yeah, yeah preston BJ wilson wallace. went ninth i didn't realize he went ninth yeah preston wilson was a great great high school player um, he started as a shortstop mm-hmm. hmm. uh, shannon stewart at 19 jason kendall at 23 yeah the a great catcher's draft between kendall very and good Jojo. catcher's draft um kendall i still think one of the pirates all-time war leaders is he really probably the team goodness player. gracious who, if I had to guess, who's the all-time? Is it McCutcheon? I would have to think about this. No, it's it's almost certainly um, Willie Stargell. Willie Stargell. Or okay. um, no, sorry. Um, oh my God, I'm closing my eyes so I don't see it on the baseball reference page. Honus Wagner. I'm sorry. It's 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 Honus Wagner. Honus, it's Wagner. Honus Wagner. Then Clemente. Paul. Clemente. Wagner, I just didn't think Archie would be around Vaughn, as long. I didn't think he made it long enough. The top row of Pirates war leaders is a mm. lot of black and white. Like <laughs> the the good days for this franchise were a long, long time ago. And yes, the most recent pirate, uh, in Jason the top Bay, is McCutcheon had forty point four WAR as a pirate. Kendall had thirty point seven. What was Jason, Jason Bay? Kendall is twenty fourth on this list. Uh, Jason huh. Bay does not make this list. Does he really not? Why did it feel like he was he better for a longer period of time there? I mean, he wasn't. He just wasn't there very long. Ultimately. That must be it. 
Um, Barry Bonds is in the top ten. Any word on how the Jason Bay signing went with the New York Mets? It did not go well. No. It really did not go well. Uh, okay. John, speaking of things that have not gone well thus far, and this is a surprise because this is one of those things where folks and having watched Christian Pache last night uh, against the Braves and what that looked like and just still a, a, quite a long way for him to go at the plate. He's batting ninth uh, for an Oakland A's lineup, John, that I don't know if you've watched them this season, but the it's Braves really retired 17 straight and it's, really bad. it's so bad. It's, the, A's are, the A's are quietly very, very bad. Like, bullpen's good though the pitching was fine Irvin, i well, like the pitching's the pitching's yeah. fine but there's just there's the lineup scored, is atrocious i believe the second fewest runs in the majors i could um, see that yes they detroit has the fewest runs scored and hmm. oakland is a few runs ahead of pittsburgh and the white Sox have the fourth fewest runs scored in baseball do they really yes hmm who's the most how right has tony larusa not lost his job already i don't understand the right we this. know the answer to that well yeah but we, we still yes the, the, the oakland a's cannot hit whatsoever no, Just it's it's hit. bleak, man. Elvis Andrews in the two hole there. Yeah, that that's team, all you need to know. Yeah, that team really cannot hit, and it's gonna yeah. get worse after the deadline when they when they start moving guys too. Who else can you move? There's no one to move on this roster oh, I just anymore. Mean, I mean, worse overall. Like like Sean Murphy. Like I don't know. I, guess, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of the thing with the A's, which is always the thing with the A's. It's like, what are you holding on to guys for at a certain point? Like, Oof. what what is what is the point? Like, that's that is the A's. What is the point of this ultimately? Did you see that Michael Harris catch last night? I did not see that, Michael. Oh, Harris my God. Us. You got to go to MLB's. What is that app that I told you about on their MLB.com thing where you can just pull up different clips and all that kind of stuff on their streamable thing? I fr- they have a name for it. And I just don't remember what it's called. But, uh, no, he um, his range, John, is just preposterous. Like, he had this jump yes, on. A, it it would have been a double, and it saved Kyle Wright. He's a good defensive player. He's already gonna, really good. The bat's still got a long way to go, but him in the field is uh, is going to be a lot of fun. Michael Harris, like it, Andrew Jones was in attendance with his son Drew, and even they panned the camera to Andrew when Harris made that jump and made the catch, and just covered a crazy amount of ground to bring in the catch. Like Andrew was like, "Whoa!" Like you just saw his reaction where he's like, "Oh!" And when you get that from Andrew, you're like, "All right, we're good. We're we're in good shape." Potential future uh, number one pick, Drew Jones, which is going to make all of us feel ancient. Did you see that Red Sox players where it's like Manny Ramirez Jr. Yeah, Manny Ramirez and then son, Sheffield and then somebody son. else? Yeah, it's that's the thing. We are we are we are now the the folks who are getting oh the the players' kids showing up. Yeah, I don't like it. I don't no, like it's it. It's very John. weird, especially because there. Are, I feel like as the generations go on and as you know, this stuff gets better and better, we're probably going to see more of these guys' kids because they're yeah. playing baseball at the highest level possible as youths. And how does this work? Because Harris is the second, and then we have juniors. How do you decide if you're going to be the second or a junior? How does that work? Good question. You'd have to ask. Uh, I think I like that George Foreman got around this by just naming all his kids George. <laughs> yeah. But like, how does that work? I, I want to know. Like, how do you become the second and not junior? How is that not? I, I don't know how they figure that out. Um, well, things I also don't know how to figure out is Joey Bart and the situation in San Francisco, John. So he gets sent down. He's really struggled this year. He's down to triple A. Man, I why do you think Joey Bart has struggled as much as he has in San Francisco this year? And do you also think that this is like, if you're a Giants fan, you're, you're pretty nervous about his future in the big leagues. Sure. I mean, the answer to why he struggled is pretty straightforward. He ran a strikeout rate of almost 50% this season. Like mm-hmm. you, you cannot be a successful major leaguer if you're striking out in nearly half your plate appearances. You know, he had a swinging strike rate of almost 20%. That's impossible to manage, mm-hmm. you know? Like you, you, he just simply can't make enough contact to be a good major leaguer at that at that level. Even if he and he was even with a fourteen percent walk rate. Yeah. Um. So that's I mean that's a very straightforward answer there. And you, and it's worth noting that you know Gabe Kapler in talking about Bart getting sent down has already said you know he's going to go down to AAA and he's going to work on some swing stuff. So that you know suggests that um, at least mechanically they figured something. It's like hey this needs to change. Like, and that's not surprising, um, especially considering that Bart is you know a, a basically a rookie catcher like. Rookie catchers are hard to develop. Catchers in general are hard to develop. Like, they have an incredible Everybody workload. can't be William Contreras, is what I'm saying. <laughs> no, and then, like, I think what probably helps Contreras is that he doesn't have to catch all the time. You know, but you know what's the... weird? He hits better when he catches. I mean, that's not surprising. I'd always I'd always thought there was something of the guys who hit better when they were in the field than as a DH because they were able to stay mentally in the game more hmm. than just sitting on the bench more often. Yeah. But... Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not surprised that Bart has struggled because, I mean, for starters, too, like, he has a grand total of, um, how many minor league plate appearances does he have? Uh, you know, since he got drafted, he's got a grand total of about 
700 ish minor league plate appearances that's, mm-hmm. not, that's not very many you know yeah he's usually one over a thousand yeah he's only spent he only spent 87 or 22 games in double a 67 in triple a last hmm. season uh before he got you know he had a cup of coffee at one point and buster posey got hurt and we saw this last year too he struck out a lot he has he has struck out a lot in the higher levels of both the minors and at the major league level so you know, clearly there's something they need to do. But I'm not surprised, you know, given that this is a young catcher who doesn't have a whole lot of professional experience, um, you know, because he was, I mean, he was drafted out of college. So they, you know, the idea was uh, we can, relatively speaking, fast track him. But I mean, you're seeing, you're seeing the same too right now with Adley Rutschman. Granted, uh, different sort of, different sort of context. Rutschman isn't striking out half the time, uh, mm-hmm. just a quarter of the time. But he has also struggled very badly so far. Like, and this is a guy who everyone, you know, when I wrote about him and, you know, when in everything I've read about him scouting wise, everyone has said, this guy is the second Joe Maurer. You know, this guy mm-hmm. is the next coming of, you know, this guy is the next great catcher in baseball. Like, even he is struggling very badly after demolishing the minor leagues every single step of the way. Um, coming up as a catcher is really hard, you know, and I'm not surprised that the Giants are doing this. Um, and it makes sense too. I think in the same way you saw with the Mariners with Jared Kalenic, another guy who has all the tools in the world, but um, didn't get a lot of time in the minor leagues. And obviously, I think to the the lost pandemic season is really you know is I think making itself felt on a yeah. lot of these younger guys. But in particular with Kalenic, you know, had the hot spring training, did get the call up, really didn't hit. Obviously, didn't hit this season. Too many strikeouts. I think it is probably there is probably some value to being able to tell those guys go back down to the minors. Where you're comfortable, not even so much where you're comfortable, but where we know you've had success before, you know, work on some things down there. You're going to get that feeling back of, oh, yeah, because I I think at a certain point with these players, you worry that it's going to start to snowball in terms of, like, can I even hit anymore? Mm -hmm. You know, you can't keep running these guys out there if they're basically just beating themselves. Again, a 45% strike rate is impossible to manage in, in, in any way. So I wouldn't be surprised if part of this was. You know, not just uh, in terms of Bart, like, you know, let's work on some swing stuff, but also just like like they said, it's a reset. Clear your head, you know, go be somewhere, you know, go go hit without worrying about the effect on a major league team. You know, yeah. go call pitches without worrying about that effect. Go go to a more relaxed, less competitive environment where you can focus on the things we need you to focus on instead of having to focus on, hey, if we get this pitch call wrong, we might lose a game that might be the difference between going to the playoffs or not. Yeah. You know? And I think it makes sense, too. Uh, the, the reason I brought up Kalenic is I think it just makes sense for some of these guys, too. Like, they do just need a little more seasoning. And being able to do that in a place where it's like, go. Like, and you see with Kalenic now, he's raking in AAA. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I assume the Mariners are waiting to see one thing in particular before they decide on the call-up. But but if anything, it just proves, too, that, like, prospect development isn't linear. You know, you saw right. it with Kalenic. You've seen it with Joe Adele to, you know, bring the Angels up again. You, you see it with Bart now. Like, it is not a straight line. Uh, you saw it with Pache. Like, Especially hitting. Hitting is the single hardest thing to do at the major league level. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're seeing why with these guys that, you know, it's, it is. Really you know, it's also difficult. hard to do, John. Bring out back to back first ballot Hall of Fame catchers in the same organization. That was something I always thought about where it's like, if I have something like that, I don't want to redo it. I don't want to immediately after. It's like whoever replaces Nick Saban, uh, Godspeed, because the idea, the idea that you're just going to be able to keep, uh, like, no, even and that's... with. Even with the point. infrastructure there and like that, man, the pressure for Bart to follow Posey, I imagine that also plays a part in this. Like he has a lot of pressure where it's like you are responsible for keeping this thing going. There, it's a little different than for a somebody to follow. Like here's the difference. It's easier to follow JT Snow as Brandon Belt than it is to follow. Hey, well, don't, uh, don't let Giants fans hear that. They adore JT Snow. Who doesn't but... love JT Snow? Like who, do, who was not uh... a big JT Snow guy back in the day? But that's a really good point. Like, be, he's being asked to replace a first ballot Hall of Famer, mm-hmm. multiple World Series champion, former MVP from a team that just won 107 or whatever it was yep. games. You know, that's a it's really like, get ready, task. man. You need to do this. You got to carry the and, torch because Posey not... unexpectedly retired. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, I think in the Giants, the the way the Giants ideally would have handled this was would be to have had Bart up as Posey's basically as his as his understudy to spend yes. an entire season as the backup. Maybe not the entire season as the backup, you know, maybe get a f- two months in AAA and then bring him up to be mm-hmm. you know, playing semi-regularly. But yeah, with Posey there, kind of teaching him the, the lay of the land. And I, I think that, yeah, Posey's rather sudden retirement changed that. Because you're right, not not every situation like this ends up being a Peyton Manning, Andrew Luck mm-hmm. situation, where you just make that nice seamless transition from one superstar into the other. Sometimes it just doesn't work. And we're seeing that with Bart, and hopefully he can get back on track in AAA because he's a great young player and be a shame if, you know... I, 
that's the thing. I don't think this is the end for him by any stretch. It's just, I, I think, yet another sign that player development's really hard. Hitting is really hard. Being a young player in the major leagues is really hard. And it benefits no one to just see, you know, when these guys come up, just to assume, oh, they're going to be stars right away, even if they mm-hmm. are prospects with, you know, huge tools and evaluators love them and their number whatever on some list. Like, no, it's when when the rubber hits the road, like, sometimes some of these guys are going to struggle. I mean, the, the one I always go back to is go back and look at Mike Trout's first, first uh, stint in the major leagues. It was terrible. Hmm. You know, not even the best player we've ever seen got off to a tough start. And How long has it been? What year players. was that? That was 2008, I want to say, 2009. Uh, it's, it's been a bit since Mike Trout made his debut, which is Goodness wild gracious. to think about. Um, it is. That's why I was like, when was it, actually? Um, John. Yes. Your Red Sox. Yes. A couple of games over 500. I think if the playoffs started today, y'all are in the playoffs. Yes, they're the third wild card right now. That's insane. The AL East has four playoff teams. <laughs> mm-hmm. The AL East has four playoff teams. I mean... Th- the league as a whole has how many teams over 500 right now at this point? Like, there are like six in each league. Yeah. I mean, um, we talked about it, I think, last week or the week before, where it's like it seems like a lot of the playoffs have already been decided because everyone is just kind of already yeah. like 10 to 15 games over 500. Yes, there, and that's there are it. a total of 13 teams above 500 in Major League Baseball right now. That's wild. And granted, there are a few teams like Chicago, Cleveland um, are both a game under 500, Philly. Uh, the, the Angels are both right in like a few games under 500. Um, but that's where really the Marlins it. Like, now. Uh, the Marlins, I mean, the Marlins, another like the Marlins should be better than they are. They really yeah. haven't, they've been an unlucky team, but they're seven games under 500. They're seven. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, that I, the Red Sox are here in part because their offense finally woke up. That's really been the biggest part of it. Uh, they've gotten some really good starts throughout that. Obviously, Michael Waka somehow threw a complete game. Yeah, shutout. explain Michael Waka to me, John. I can't. Explain it's Michael Waka and all, what's going on here. Or some kind of dark curse. I mean, that, I mean, that's the thing when you get a pitch to contact guy who's good at pitching to contact in a year where it's both harder to make contact and harder to get to make authoritative contact like sometimes those balls are just gonna like it's it's babbit luck i think you're seeing something not quite as i mean the martin perez stuff is also on its own a little hard to explain because no it's perez not and... it's texas rangers it, we've <laughs> talked about this it's the texas rangers juice whatever they're doing like but that's, I... also, but that's also kind of thing like if you are a pitcher who can locate your strikes particularly mm-hmm. well and you throw a sinker or a cutter or some kind of two seamer that you know encourages like being smashed into the ground like with the way defensive shifts work and with the ball being kind of dead and whatever else is going on like you can run into these every now and again. I mean, Aaron Cook used to do this on the regular, and Aaron Cook is a ter- was a terrible pitcher. Aaron that Cook. Struck out now, like I never thought I would hear that name on this podcast. Aaron Cook has thrown multiple Maddoxes. Like, <laughs> it's just a thing that can happen. Colorado um, Rocky legend Aaron Cook. But, like, the thing I think just as big for Boston beyond the offense waking up and the pitching being a little better is just the fact that they they don't really have any competition outside of the division right now. Mm-hmm. You know, Chicago is Chicago's a mess. Cleveland is, I think, a team that we're all just kind of looking at and being like, eh, maybe you'll be there. But, like, you know, there's doesn't there doesn't seem to be enough offense here, even though they've been way better offensively this year than, than really in, in multiple seasons past. I mm-hmm. mean, we just got finished talking about the Angels, who, again, have lost 13 games in a row and are bad. Like... Texas seems to be kind of sort of picking it up, but again, not a particularly good team in Texas. Like, you know, it, it says a lot that a team that went whatever the Red Sox went in April, 11 and 19 or whatever it was, whatever hideous start they got off to can still climb its way back into the playoff race in part because there just aren't that many good teams anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and because MLB is so gracious as to give everyone an extra playoff spot, even though again, there are a grand total of 13 teams above 500 right now. Hmm. And like, like we talked about, like you said, like, it really does feel like here are the division leads as they currently stand in throughout baseball. Seven and a half games for the Yankees in the AL East, four games for the Twins in the Central, nine and a half games for Houston in the West, eight games for the Mets in Mil- in the East. Uh, the only two divisions that are relatively close are the Central, where Milwaukee's a half game up on St. Louis, but then has a seven and a half game up cushion on the third place Pittsburgh Pirates. Look at that. And the Dodgers in the West, where they're a half game, a game and a half up on on San Diego, and five and a half up on San Francisco. Hmm. Um, there are so that that's two out of six division races. I guess three if you want to include the AL Central, that are relatively up for grabs. I don't think anyone has any real res, like. I don't think anyone is going to say though that the Dodgers are not the heavy favorite in the NL West, and mm-hmm. that that's not how things are going to shake out. Really, you're just looking at the two central divisions right now. Yeah. And that's more, again, that's more about mediocrity fighting mediocrity than it is about, like, for example, three really good teams all being in a, in a dogfight or something. 
it's it's really not good that the great majority of this summer for a lot of fan bases is either going to be well we're already pretty locked into a playoff spot so it's just about staying healthy and seeing what we get at the deadline and that for over half the league what's left of this year is um guess we'll see what we'll do for next year instead like Mm -hmm. you know and and again i think the red sox prove that you know you can have a bad start to the season and you're not out of it by any stretch of the imagination but you know if you're if you're a tigers fan or if you're a mariners fan or if you're a a a cubs fan or a marlins fan you're looking at the rest of the season going okay what now you know it it's it's first week of june and we're effectively out of the postseason conversation. well you're looking at the farm system you're like who's getting yeah. called up who can be fun for us to go watch down right the but that's here? i mean that's just not a that's really that's a really bad place for mlb to be yeah. over half the league is already looking at the rest of the season and going well there's no point to this yeah you know that's really really bad and even of those teams that are in the conversation the great majority of them are looking around and going well the division's over right better hope we can get a wild card spot oh wait there are three of them it's not even going to be that tough a race exactly like, there's just going to be very little drama and tension, it feels like, through the heart Which of the season. Which was not the point of adding more playoff right. games. Yeah, the, the whole idea, well, ostensibly the whole idea was um, we'll create more playoff spots to create mm-hmm. more competition for them. What you're seeing is the realistic playing out of that, which is this is really just about giving teams that much, that much less incentive to try. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, you can see it now. Like, again, a, f- a below 500 team is almost certainly going to make the playoffs this year. Or a roughly think so? 500 team. I think so. I mean, hmm. the last wild card team will probably, I mean, if it's Boston, you know, maybe they're in somewhere in that 85 win range. Yeah. But if it's an NL team, I mean, the wild card teams are Atlanta is in, is a game back the wild card and they're just over 500. Uh, St. Louis is a couple games back of the wild card. Well, that's, that's because of the division, but hmm. you know, San Francisco is in the wild card spot. They're only a few games over 500, you know, uh, the, like I said, but what we started with the angels are three games under 500 and have lost 13 games in a row. And they're only two and a half games out of a playoff spot. Yeah. Like that's just, that's really not a good sign at all yeah. about, you know, the, both the white Sox and the, and, and the guardians are under 500. They're only a game and a half out of a playoff spot. The white Sox have been absolutely terrible this year. And they're, God, I want to see they're, what the, they're the guardians a three game hot streak from being in the postseason. Like if the guardians are in a dog fight, they're like, I, they just keep saying no. The Dolan uh, the, uh, ownership is, group's like, no, 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 no. We don't want this. Somebody take it. Somebody. Well, I feel like it's gonna end up all of like the the Western Conference in the NBA, where it just seemed like no one wanted those last two playoff spots in yeah. part because all those teams were just bad, mm. and second because the only thing it guaranteed was a first round matchup with the Suns, who they were just gonna smoke you out of existence, or whoever the number yeah. one seed in the Western Conference. It was the Suns, and the Pelicans actually uh, played them pretty it, well, though. But the Pelicans, yeah. who made it through, of all teams, they were like, what, 12 games? Maybe more than that, under 500, and they're the ones who read. And it just looks weird when you look yeah, at that. And, but, that's, was, but that's what MLB has locked itself into now, is not just a, a summer where there's no real, you know, there's no real pennant race that's going to happen here. Yeah. Um, I think there will be some. Right. I think the Mets and the Braves will be a pennant race. I think that's coming. I mean, I that think... might, but we were talking about an eight-game division lead. I just that is enormous. The Braves get the Astros or the Athletics again tonight. I think the Mets are on a West Coast trip right now. I think they got the They're Padres. Playing the Padres, yeah. Um, but I mean, regardless, you're you're gonna get a summer without too much competition, and yeah. then you're gonna get a postseason where the first round is gonna be probably a lot of is probably gonna be a pretty snoozy affair because you're gonna have some pretty mediocre teams making the cut. This yeah. Red Sox team is not good. They can hit pretty well, and they have some. Decent but you might add. Pitching. Let's, you might do you, some I mean, stuff maybe, this summer. But, like, but that's the thing. Like, You get into that conversation of, of who's available. Well, most of those teams that aren't going to make the playoffs don't really have anything to offer anymore. Right. And this is something we've talked about the last few years, that those teams really just... they like. You look at the list, like for example, that list uh, on MLB.com of, of starters who might get moved at the deadline. Look at that transition. Here you go, John. Perfect. Who do you think moves here? Um, I, I agree that Montas... I mean, I'm surprised the A's haven't already traded him. I don't really yeah. know what they're waiting for at this point. Maybe they just wanted to guarantee folks, like, hey, look, Frankie Montas is healthy. He's fine now. Give us prospects. Like, I think he's a lock to get moved. I would not be surprised... I mean, Cincinnati has been better. I would not be surprised if they were to move one of Castillo or Melee, but kind of who knows with them, because, again, that's a move they should have made already. Um, I mean, Castillo's I am, what, yeah, 29? I am certain that Perez will get moved from Texas if they are more than five games out of a playoff spot by the time the deadline rolls around because there is zero reason for them to keep him. I there, Similarly, a guy like Quintana on the Pirates, if he can manage to keep up relatively decent production, I'm sure some team will come calling for him as a five-and-fly guy at the end of the rotation. Mm-hmm. But that's really it. 
You know, there's really not a whole lot beyond that unless things go catastrophically wrong for, like, like we said, like Philadelphia or for the Red Sox or for, you know, some, one of those other teams that's kind of in the playoff picture but ends up, like, it has a free fall or something. Mm. But even like you're seeing now, like, the Angels are in total free fall, but again, still only two and a half games out of the playoffs. And even if they were to move into seller mode, what are they offering? See, you know? I want to see the flip side of that, where I like, I want to see the Marlins be aggressive. Where they're like, we don't like this, we should be better, we're trading for... Uh, this good player who can help us down the stretch and win some more games because they don't need any more arms. They don't need any more of this. They are already loaded. Like their rotation's already too big. Like they've already yeah. got too many arms. That's a good thing well, for th- them to th- be and in. And I think, but I think this this deadline would give a good opportunity for a team like that to get aggressive because I do think a yeah. lot of teams are probably just going to sit on their hands. Yeah. You know, and I think that I would show good faith to the fan base where it's like, I, hey, I yeah, we're I not going to make the playoffs, but hey, granted, we're I haven't, trying. I haven't looked at a. F- there's not like a master list out there of like, ooh, who might be available at the deadline, and then we still get nonsense stuff like, well, the Nationals trade Juan Soto. And it's like, shut, shut the hell up. That's not going to happen. Josh Bell, though, he's a good piece. Yeah, but like, there, there'll be some hitters available. There'll be some relievers mm-hmm. available. There'll be some starters available. I just don't see it being that. I mean, I don't know. Like, maybe we get a frenetic trade deadline like we did last year because everyone is theoretically in like in the hunt except for you know right ten or twelve teams that are just categorically out of it. But we'll see. I I'm just skeptical that. You know, the, the, I'm, I'm skeptical, particularly that the Red Sox will make additions because they've also just not been a team that's done that lately unless they can get something that's very cost effective, a la Kyle Schwarber last season. Yeah. Um, and I'm just skeptical overall that, you know, we're going, I'm, I'm just skeptical that we're going to get anything better than a mediocre team, really, in any regards out of, out of those last wild card spots. 